Hey, let's start the show. For Thursday, January 13th, 2022, welcome to This Is Only a Test, the official podcast of Tested.com. Hello and welcome to the show this week. I don't know about you guys, I am kind of still kind of, kind of still in the post CES news hangover, meaning that there's like these these threads of things that come popping up that I, I miss at CES or miss following last week. That now I'm like, what 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 is this thing? Um, but yeah, feel, doing good. We have a we have a special guest this week. Kishore, of course, is here. Kishore, good to see you. Good to see you. It's all vaporware, Norm. You'll be I, fine. It's all vaporware. <laughs> I, you know, it's it's almost like this. It's like I, I, you know, we used to do a lot more tech coverage. We used to, you know, go to CES and try to see as much as we can, chat with as many of the the, the product people. And what and and it, at CES, there was always this, you know, like a not necessarily a reality distortion field, but you can feel the the. the mini reality distortion fields emanating from every booth. They want to like, LG is like, look at our stuff. Samsung's like, look at our stuff. And it's like, you're parsing through it, deflecting it. Like, no, marketing, 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 BS, BS, BS. Uh, ooh, no, that could be interesting. And doing it remotely, it's it's not as fun. It's not as fun to, to try to contrast, you know, the, the flashiness. And there was no flashiness, of course, this year. Uh, so it's just press releases and some, you know, private demos that reporters got to report on. But, you know, things like, ooh, that projector kind of looked cool. But, it, you know, it, it would have been neater to see some of those things in person to really give a fair evaluation. But anyway, uh, I digress. We have a very special guest this week. If you're watching the video, you already see him right here. You may recognize him. It is Clayton, a.k.a. Uncle Jesse of Uncle Jesse's hey uh, YouTube channel, a yeah. 3D printing and expert. TikTok. And TikTok. I, and TikTok. And YouTube Shorts. Her. And YouTube I would shorts. offer. Yeah, and I YouTube think shorts. your TikToks might be better than the YouTube channel. I might be on the minority there. I mean, oh. if there's one thing I've learned about TikTok <laughs> is uh, you gotta just make whatever it is that you're working on, just make a quick video on it and post it. And then you never know. It might just completely blow up out of nowhere. <laughs> yeah, TikTok is such a wild space. And it's one of those things that I, my wife was the one at the beginning of the pandemic in 2020 was all about TikTok, and I was like, I am never going on that platform. It looks horrible. That says no, makes no sense. And then <laughs> slowly but surely started on there. I was like, man, this is pretty cool. There's some amazing creators on here. Wow, I'm actually seeing people that I don't follow on the internet and seeing some wild things on here. This is really cool, and it just does a, an amazing job of promoting and getting stuff into your feed. Really cool stuff into your feed. At, like at yeah. CES. I think I've seen 18 videos of that BMW with its different <laughs> oh, the, color panels. The, right, right, the, right, right. The it's e got like the paper on the side. panels or something. Yeah, like. yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and people are now showing that when I say it's, projector, uh, there's that Samsung projector that you can project anywhere and angle. But like it, it, there's it's definitely flashy, but. It's it's like very bite sized consumable content, and and, and I'm I'm not ragging on it. I like I oh, think I'm, TikTok sure. is fascinating. No, 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 and no. I, I I wish I understood it more. Um, like you know, this is this is why I have nephews and nieces because I can go to them and say, "What are you guys into?" Damn, that's gonna make us let, all obsolete tell in, you, in a year or two. I'm the I'm the old guy because I'm on Twitter. <laughs> that's yeah. like that's the old man platform is twitter <laughs> so uh, so being on tiktok it's helping me stay in that young that young man's game <laughs> yeah yeah I, I gotta say being on tiktok my kitchen has never been cleaner because of tiktok <laughs> oh because all the different hacks but i i uh, just to build on what what you're saying clayton like you also get uh, like a real diversity of creators that like YouTube's algorithm doesn't surface in that kind of way. So no, I've actually, doesn't. as somebody that follows a bunch of 3d printers on there, I've like found mm -hmm. a lot of different creators um, uh, on that platform that I, I, I haven't before. But speaking of, I think for our audience that doesn't know you, uh, Clayton, oh, why yeah. don't you, do you want to give up like a little like background, how you got into uh, all your different nerd rooms and then 3D printing? Itself? Yeah. 
Yeah, sure. So uh, my background, hi, everybody. Uh, for those of you who don't know, I do YouTube. It's primarily uh, 3D printing related, uh, some tech related things, lots of nerdy things, action figures, uh, helmets, all sorts of cosplay related stuff. Um, yeah, I, my passion has been comics probably since Spawn issue two came out and picking it up in the grocery store and going, oh, my gosh, this isn't what the comics I, I'm familiar with and just got completely hooked and have been a big comic book. Um, uh, I was a big Marvel fan for a really long time. Uh, briefly worked at DC Comics, which was amazing. Oh. Uh, get oh, basically paid, basically paid in comic books. So <laughs> every week, <laughs> which was really cool. Um, but yeah, and then I ended up in the fashion tech space for the last, oh my goodness, 10, 15 years uh, before fully doing the YouTube thing. And uh, one of the creators there that we worked with was uh, someone by the name of Denise Peleg, who did a 3D printed fashion line. And mm. at that point, I was already interested in 3D printers. And I can't remember if I'd already picked up my first MakerBot Mini, but it really cemented my passion for it, discussing how she was designing and modeling and making 3D printed clothing and a whole fashion line. And uh, it was sort of the inspiration to keep going and finding larger machines that you can pick up. Actually, she was working on the BQ Wit Box, which was a larger 3D printer. And that's the ex that was the second 3D printer that I purchased was the BQ Wit Box because of her, because it had a bigger print area that I was able to print like a Daredevil mask and those sort of things on it. Yeah. And, and combining that, those worlds of, you know, like wearable, like masks, right? Like helmets, you know, you have your regular helmet. That's where we first met you at New York Comic Con a couple yes. of years ago when you had your, <laughs> yeah. your full, mag beautiful Magneto costume. Um, but the yeah. availability of 3D modeling tools, that kind of perfect timing of, you know, uh, the um, kind of the mat uh, maturing of FDM technologies. Um, and then now this ascent of resin. Uh, and all the people it's, being curious about it, from the modeling to the, the hobbyists, uh, to the professionals, the timing could not be more perfect for you to really create awesome content around it. Jump in there. Yeah, no, it's it's been a perfect storm of um, continuous evolution, especially for me. And I love making cosplay related things and just printing them, not even necessarily finishing them, just printing them and, and making statues and whatnot. Um, but it, you know, I originally started with Pepicura, which is the Bayer mm. basics. This was before I could even get my hand or even before I knew what a 3d printer was, was doing Pepicura yeah. and I loved it burning my fingertips with hot glue and, you know, super glue or whatever, super whatever glue and paper be. cuts. That's the best part of yeah. Pepicura. And, and it was like hours upon hours of just sitting there. And it was sort of meditative of going through that process. And then prices of 3d printers were still very expensive at the time and that's when i got my first one but it was it's progressively it's so amazing to see from like 2015 i paid what was it fifteen hundred dollars and which is absurd to me for this tiny 3d printer <laughs> <laughs> and it did a horrible job at printing but it got me hooked on this whole concept and now for a build volume that like three times the size of what I was printing with originally, you can get for under $200 on an FDM 3D printer. And even yeah. a few years ago on the resin scene, it wasn't a thing that you could get a resin 3D printer for probably under $1,000. And now that's a, you know, you're looking at, I think I got a printer for $100 a few months ago off of I Amazon. I saw that, $99 I did a video yeah, go. I was like, this is yeah, insane. Yeah. I was like, I can't believe I'm able to get a resin 3D printer and it prints and prints well for a hundred bucks. This is crazy. So it's it's just continuing to evolve and seeing where this goes is is going to be very very exciting. <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah. Uh, I kind of want to yeah. just jump right right in there and continue on this. Yeah. I know we we're going to talk about some of the pop culture stuff we've been enjoying and we'll definitely get to some of those shows toward the end. Maybe save that mm -hmm. uh, cuz you know we'll be uh, kind of 
walking a line between spoilers and non-spoilers um, for things like Boba Fett and the shows you guys have been watching. Uh, but let's just talk about some of the printers you've been using because um, we've used some of the oh same printers, goodness. and you you've been extremely helpful yeah. um, just over Twitter f- uh, with me and, and you know sharing some <laughs> of your settings and your experiences. Try. Um, and you know, like when I first got my Saturn, you know, your 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 uh, Chuju Box settings really like help me just as a great starting point like the room well, settings for speed right? well here's Things- the here's the thing yeah here's the thing that happens when you get a fir- when you get your resin 3d printer uh or you know I'll, I'll start with just mention resin it's probably the same case on fdm for a lot of times but with resin specifically you'll get the printer and they say here's the recommended you know here's a recommended profile that you should print with the machine and it's like over doing it so that your print will succeed, which is great because you don't want that bad experience right off the bat. And with resin, it's a little bit trickier to get going uh, with than an FDM printer. There's, you know, trade offs there, but it's wild how this community works. The 3D printing community is so open to sharing you know, what, how does this work? How are you getting this to work? What sort of tips, what sort of tricks, what add-ons are you using to improve the overall process? There's a lot of that information that, that I'm redistributing because I'm finding out about it because of other makers that are posting, Hey, uh, I just found this cool, uh, little mini space heater for my 3d printer. (laughs) And, (laughs) uh, yeah, and it works really well. I was like, Oh my gosh, I've got to get that and try it out and see how that works and, you know, make content around it. And it, it works well. It's sort of that idea of, uh, just knowing, finding out what you're working on and sharing that as best you can failures and all. Yeah. So what is your current favorite 3d printer going? Oh, uh, this might seem a bit biased because of who one of my sponsors is, but uh, honestly, my favorite is the Elgu Mars 3. It's like the perfect printer for most of what I want to print. It's not too big. It's not too small. I've got the settings crazy dialed in and it can print really fast. Maybe not as fast as another machine I did, recently did a video on that I think we'll probably talk about here at one point but uh it's just the it's it's the perfect form factor of being able to not take up too much space be able to print most busts that i'm looking to print little cool characters or figurines and still have extra space like i was able to print i just did a video that i posted literally today of this professor xavier bust and was able to fit the base the torso and the head directly on the build plate there was still leftover space didn't have to rescale anything the original file you know default scale that the designer created there and it's just it just works so well for what i need it to do and not to mention on the back i can easily open it up to throw in a resin lapse cable for the time hey lapses. there you go <laughs> yeah that's what we forgot to mention you're the co-creator of the resin lapse cable uh which is an amazing yeah. accessory I, I think an essential piece of tech for anyone wanting to film their own uh 3d prints really really and, ingenious and we're there. i know we're we're andrew sink and i uh about a year ago actually a year ago now in january started here in this spot where I'm where I'm at, like ripping apart an old Elegu Mars printer that I had, and we were soldering wires and doing all sorts of over engineering, thinking through how we can do this, and ended up on a really super simple method that was like, oh my god, we had a sort of an epiphany of how this could be done, and it works so well uh, with you know specific DSLR cameras, and right now. We're in the process of rolling out Nikon camera support, and we're working on some other really cool things for, uh, you know, lots of people have old phones or tablets laying around. So we're trying to get support for that specifically. So it'll be, you know, you don't have to drop 500 plus dollars for a DSL, a DSLR camera to make a time lapse. This is just crazy to me. <laughs> right. If you have right. one, it's great. And I think the, the to explain, you know, the kind of the breakthrough you guys had was as opposed to having a time based uh, intervalometer for triggering the, tr- <laughs> the snapping of a photo, you are uh, yes. triggering the snapping of a photo 
uh, using what you know about how these resin printers work. Um, and if the goal is to create a smooth looking video where the print looks like the build plate doesn't look, looks like it's smoothly moving up or there's no jankiness in the movement, then you got to, in each cycle of each uh, of, of the print, each layer, you got to have a fixed point in that cycle where you want to trigger the photo and you guys figure that out in like, oh, wait, it, when the UV hits, perfect. Yeah, when the U light like, hits, it just trigger the photo. But it was, I can remember there were time lapses that I've shown in early videos where I literally had a, uh, you know, one of those uh, uh, shutter release cables that you could program. And I would try and sync it up to the lift speed of the printer after it was right. going and time it. And then I was manually editing thousands of photos. And I was like, oh, no, this one's in the wrong position. Delete. Go and go and go. Oh, this one's in the wrong position. Delete. It would right. take me, you know, half an hour, 40 minutes of just editing photos to create a time lapse. And this one little cable made it so much easier to uh, to actually do all of that. It, tell me that you have like a an ad going for this thing where it's like there's got to be a better way when you're like editing. <laughs> well, no, so here's 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 the funny thing about all of that is the the big request. I went to Andrew because Andrew's way smarter and way more technical than I am when it comes to building these things. And I know he's done a ton of work when it comes to things like Octoprint and creating FDM time lapses and trying to make that as easy as possible for people to get going with that. That whole process on an FDM printer is too complicated for me. It's like I need a Raspberry Pi, I've got to program it, I've got to hook this up to the printer and do this, that, and the, I don't, I haven't even actually walked through it all. <laughs> but, uh, I was like, this, I, I just want a cable. Like, why can't we just have something that plugs in, it's plug and play, and that's what we are striving to do, is just find a plug and play model for capturing time lapses, but specifically on, on the resin printer side. And in fact, you know, in theory, you could repurpose the resin lapse cable uh, for an FDM printer, potentially with a little bit of wizardry <laughs> and, and upgrades on the FDM side of things. Yeah, it doesn't require changing the code. The G code doesn't require any any part of the workflow, like the, the printing itself from your slicing to the printing kind of works independently and you're just kind of piggybacking on the the, the, right. the work, the, the how these machines work. And but we see, have you guys seen that? Um, uh, that time lapse someone shared. It might have been on TikTok. Uh, someone printing a Mandalorian uh, figure, and it was flipped upside down, right? So the build plate is a resin yes. print. But uh, they, I guess, went into their the the firmware or went into the the slicer and and uh, programmed it so the build plate went to the top of the Z axis with every layer. And so it looked like the build plate was fixed. And that was another way of getting a kind of smooth yes. build. And so triggering, a, triggering and, and the triggering, camera. Right, exactly, yeah. with every layer. Um, but I look at that, I'm like, wow, that must have taken like – eight times Forever the time, print. right? Like as opposed to the, to the opposite because they of the lift. Room. It doesn't lift yeah. fast. It's, <laughs> no. not, it's not like it's a fast lifting motion for these yeah. printers. Like with every, if you're talking about like 2,000 layers for print, you're talking about like yeah. basically resetting the printer every single time. Uh, but for it, this. Looks, it looks it looks really amazing. cool it looks because amazing. it looks like yeah. it's literally generating on the build plate in yeah. thin air almost. And you see resin dripping from some of them, yeah. which adds to the effect, I think. So yeah. bravo to who, who came up with that. That was one thing that we talked about, but that that downside of it lifting up, the time it takes, it's like, I I don't want my print that's going to take an hour and a half to now take five and a half hours <laughs> because I'm trying to do a time lapse. It's yeah, yeah. Not what I need. Yeah. Uh, well, piggybacking off of Kishore's question about your, your recommended printer. So like the Mars 3... It seems like, yeah. like I, I've been. I think we we're all comfortable recommending that now. Now that you know, CTB Systems works with Lightsheet Slicer, so the news version Lightsheet, yeah, can, 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 can work awesome. on those and the ones going forward, like the new uh, new Frozen printers. So I'm really happy about that. Um, and I guess uh, Elgu made like the, the the hardware designs of that printer open source as well. So for people who do want to go in and and look at the boards and figure out how to, you know, manufacture their own accessories, they could for that. So it's, it's a really neat thing. Yep. Um, it's of a specific size. So like the way I think about printers, I think if that's like a 
perfect entry level size. You're going to get like the bust you yes. showed, um, you know, a, a 4K panel resolution. You're going to get really beautiful miniatures, um, but not necessarily great for you know like the Magneto helmet or big big wearable pieces. No, so yeah, it's, you're, it's you're going to be from there. you're going to be looking yeah. at lots of pieces. Yeah. yeah. So where <laughs> where you, where would you recommend? To, like, yeah, if you're if you're looking to go bigger, um, I mean beyond it gets tricky uh not tricky it's just it's the price comparatively <laughs> exponentially expands the larger the larger you go but like beyond the mars the mars series of printers and there's a lot of similar printers that are there uh but you have uh, things like the anycubic mono x which is a fantastic mid what i call a mid-size printer you could and i've shown off printing on the elgu saturn uh, a full Mandalorian helmet in multiple segments. I think it was like six or eight segmented pieces and then resin welding them all together. But if you wanted to go even larger than that, then you're getting into things like, uh, we're looking at a thousand plus dollars for a printer, but the tech is, that's one area that I'm excited to see things further building on and expanding on where we've got the uh, the frozen mega 8k which i made a video on i had lots of issues with the build plate but um it, it all came down to re-leveling it but it's such a fantastic big machine to be able to print with and the one drawback that i'm seeing from most of these larger printers is something that the jupiter the elgu jupiter that's coming out with has in it that I'm hoping other manufacturers pick up on. And it's that auto feeding resin mm. tank system on it. So something like a Piopoli Phenom L, which I printed a full snake eyes helmet for a TikTok video <laughs> in, in resin on, on that machine um, would have been a perfect candidate for having a way to auto feed resin into it because you know, after about 15 to 20 hours of printing, I had to go back in there and slowly pour resin into the corner very slowly, because if you pour it too fast and the resin's not the right temp, if it's, you know, your resin, your pouring's cold, the resin in the vat's warm, uh, or it's, you're just pouring it too fast, you're going to end up with a big layer line where you've poured during the print process. And that whole auto feeding system just alleviates that entire thing, especially for it those big printers. And the auto feeding system for people that don't know, you're like literally taking the bottle and like screwing it into the into the printer itself. Yes. And it and it's one of those things where it's it's I I, I should know what the technical term is, but I don't scientific term. Is. But it's uh, it's not just dumping the resin in there. It's uh, when you need, you know, you, you can put it in there at the very beginning of your print. And as it's using resin, it's pulling resin out of the out of the bottle, which is just amazing and at, at no point have i printed anything yet on one of these big printers if i fill up the vat um which typically holds let's say two bottles two full you know one liter i should have a big bottle of resin sitting around here but i don't uh, two of the big bottles of resin that extra feed system is pretty much all i've ever needed when it comes to refilling mid print is just a little bit extra resin or one extra bottle of resin to make sure it fully prints without running out after you know whatever it is 24 plus hours of printing yeah and, and when you mentioned you know as you scale up things get almost exponentially more like complicated <laughs> like you're using yes you know, twice twice the size of something is going to use four times as much resin unless you hollow it out yes. and you're twice as and, much you're likely to have a failed print because of the sheer weight like physics <laughs> comes to into account where you know your settings can't just copy and paste you got to be way more considerate of your your whole workflow because uh, a failed print it, it's at 100 it's just, hours right is <laughs> it's, it's a lot it's going to be painful yeah and, and not just it's just oh man i've wasted all that time but man that's gonna hurt my wallet if that print fails <laughs> and that resin still it's gotten a lot cheaper compared to where it was three years ago you can get a bottle of resin for like 30 dollars now that works fairly well it was i think i was paying almost 80 dollars three years ago for resin it was crazy 60 80 bucks i mean yeah. you could still have specialty resins today that are in that price range but it's uh the for the consumer level right. 3d printers obviously when we're talking form labs mm -hmm. and more professional 
machine. Actually, Norm, were you playing around recently with the the form I labs? Have, yes, yeah, I have a form yeah. three plus, and uh, there'll be a review yeah. going up very soon. Uh, and yeah, everything is you know it's it's in the prosumer or I, I would say professional pricing and professional space because yes. they really take. They, they, the support is a little different, right? So, like, they're mm-hmm. they they test and calibrate everything. I think it's definitely in the pricier range. You're talking about 150 bucks for a liter, so up to you know four or five times as much. Um, just sheer cost per print for volume, but reliability wise, I think that's that's what you're paying for. I think in the you know, it's not that the the printers in the hobby space aren't reliable because I've had you know you and I have a lot of success with that stuff. But, yeah, you know, if you're manufacturing or you're you know, working in an environment where you can't afford a fail, right? Because of the time constraints, you know, that's why you're going to pay for, for that. Yeah. Yep. And, and then do, does yours, uh, not to spoil anything from your review, but I saw them post something on TikTok <laughs> because I follow them <laughs> on TikTok. They have the, the new build plate. Uh, it looks like you can flex the build plate and it's, it's the best amazing. thing. It's, it's, I, I mean, it, it's like, like you, yes. you put it in, can you explain? How, yeah, have yeah. You so, ha- do you have it? Have you? Played I do with have it? it. One, yes, yeah. Oh, it is the it goodness. is the best thing. <laughs> Please uh, explain to everybody else. <laughs> um, so uh, the build plate typically, like on 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 a, on a, a printer you're gonna buy out of the box, is usually a metal build plate. You know, it could be like sandblasted, you know, aluminum, or it could be steel, like that. Usually has like a little rough surface. You know, it needs to be really flat, right? Because you want to have it really tight to your your film. It's almost flush between that, the film, and your LCD screen on a, on a MSLA printer. You don't want any extra space. Um, that's when you can have can have failures, uh, and that also means when you're releasing a print from it, right? Unless you, even if you have a raft, you're going to have you, you don't want any release from your lower levels to your uh, your, your base levels. Uh, scraping off a print can be, you know, that's part of the workflow, right? And I've, I'm sure you've had it as well, Clayton, where You've like gouged your plate, or you've had just oh, like yes. just terrible chunks that are like you just can't get underneath this little piece. Get it off, and and that's why you have like your all these like little accessories of like your your plastic scraper tools or uh, what, what's that one that you recommended? The um, I love it. It's the the uh, um, uh, the razor blades, plastic razor blades scraper. Oh tool. yes, yeah, yeah those love that. Right, um, and the Wham Blam system. So as a third-party system, where you basically modify the build plate by putting a magnetic, you uh, you had glue like a you like three M adhesive a piece of a magnet onto your plate, and then use a piece of uh, thin steel on top, bendable steel. So when you release the plate, you can actually bend the steel, and the print pops off. That's basically what they're doing with the the Form Labs new build plate. But the best part of it is their flexible steel isn't just the flat piece; it wraps around, and becomes a handle. And so you never actually separate and remove the entire spring steel from the build plate. All you do is press the sides and it pops off. And it's always perfectly aligned. So even with the wham-bam so systems, I, I, you have to remove the, the, the take it off. thin plate, take it off, and then you – I always get resin on the bottom of it. So you're always, you flex it. I'm always getting resin onto the, either the magnet or, or the bottom of the plate. I do a little bit of cleaning and it adds a little bit of time. And that's why you can buy extra little pieces of steel – here with the uh, the Form Labs one, the Build Plate Two, comes off. Press the sides. I've never had a failure, and it allows me to so think nice. like FDM. So something I'll I'll, I'll show. Uh, you showed that that dragon, that dragon, the mm-hmm. the, the amazing articulated dragon. Uh, that's a like a FDM, a, a print design for FDM printing. You would rarely yeah. want to print that on a resin printer because even on a Wham Bam systems, like you could pop off like one of the legs could easily snap off oh i've, I've done printed that. yes <laughs> multiple times <laughs> broken the tail the, uh, multiple yeah, times right? yeah <laughs> uh with the the form labs one perfect every time it just pops off oh my goodness and it, get it's literally the most amazing it's the most amazing thing to see you know i've used uh, a lot of the i have a lot of the wham bam flex plates uh, and love them and i have some other ones but having that system where you don't even take it off it just i was like oh my goodness now that is impressive it just yeah. looks like it works so well where they pushed it and it showed it bow and the print just comes right off. Yeah. <laughs> like, this is ingenious <laughs> yeah um 
Yeah, it's one of those things that I'm sure uh, I hope they get a patent for it because like, I, you know, I could see variants of it, you know, pop up in all sorts of other printers. But like, that's what I love about like, there's like these minor little innovations here and there. It's not just about screen mm-hmm. resolution and screen size. And, you know, a lot of these are <laughs> the, the emergence the screen of wars. Sony, <laughs> the screen wars, right? It's because because these companies are all they 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 don't have to develop their own software or the the controller boards. They're just getting it from CTB systems, right? And yeah. then so they're just kind of sourcing the the separate motors, the rails, making their build build plates. And yeah, it's like that requires work, but allows them to iterate fast because you know they're just kind of riding the wave of all this development. Um, and and they're all you know located relatively. They can find these these mono screens. Uh, but some real innovation I saw on your channel. Was this what is this a high tree uh, printer? Oh, the yeah. rocket. Yeah, I want to yeah. talk about the, this. Uh, it looks this, like a soda uh, stream. The, the missile, like the <laughs> missile, the missile <laughs> silo that I have sitting next to me, or the Keurig machine right here. Yeah. <laughs> oh my god. Okay. I haven't moved it off so, the desk yet. I've got to find a new place for it. <laughs> this like flips resin printing on its head, like where yeah. the build plate is not upside down. It is more akin to. FDM style, where the the plate is, you know, uh, on the bottom, and your but your vat is also still underneath it, and it doesn't use film. So explain how this works. Yeah, so here's the here's the print. By the way, I have this. This is all washed and clean, which is why I don't have gloves on. I've sort of left this as a display piece at the moment. Um, but yeah, this is the build plate, and so like you said, a nor- normally with the typical resin three D printers that a lot of the consumers buy today. It, they print upside down. So it lifts, it goes, the build plate goes into a vat of resin. There's little light UV light images that appear and basically cure the resin and it slowly lifts out of the vat and it prints upside down. This, <laughs> it's going the opposite. It still blows my mind watching it actually print. So you have a huge bucket filled with resin. I do mean a very large bucket of resin. And then this build plate sits on top of rails and it slowly lowers into the resin with a thin film of resin over the build plate and a light, a UV light shines down on it and it slowly progressively builds up on the print. And one of the cool things about it is that when the print is done, it's completely submerged under resin. So right. it has to lift back out and it just it visually it's one of the coolest things to watch it lifting the print lifting out of this ooze of liquid. And now you see your amazing print when it prints. Um, <laughs> but it's just it, it's it's again one of these t- typically machines like this have as far as I'm aware have been around for quite some time but cost significantly more money. And I mean not like a thousand dollars, two thousand Fifty thousand plus, I've heard, for some of these massive resin machines that uh, typically, you know, companies are using to three D print things. So having it, this technology make its way over, and this is the first of the machines that's you know consumer ready that I've seen out there, and was happy to give this a test. It did not work. A hundred percent great. It made a massive mess. I don't know if you watched the video, but it made have, yeah. a massive mess working with it. And the one thing I was really impressed by the company Hitchery, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right or Hitchery, is I called out a number of issues with it. And normally what will happen is just to give everybody a background. So I make videos on 3D printers and review them and we'll typically, Norm does this as well. You call out issues and then they'll email you and say, hey, why'd you do this? It, that's not an issue. That's, <laughs> you know, it works just fine. I'm like, no, that's that's an issue. It should never have been designed that way. It's like a horrible design idea. No, they came right back and we were like, okay, we watched your video. Here's all these points and immediately posted to their, it's on Kickstarter that, um, hey, we're already looking at addressing X, Y, and Z callouts that he's made, and we're trying to see how we can resolve this. And uh, I was I was very impressed to see that quick turnaround and literally zero, you know, pushback or feedback from them um, on the video. Which at one point I thought was overly negative, and I try not to be, but it's. Uh, I mean, it prints. The one thing that's amazing about this is that it prints really well the print i mean it's just looks the prints look fantastic off this machine it's just it is not fun working with this build plate because resin as it's curing you'll see here i don't know if i'll be able to get it in the yeah. camera is yep. it's 
you know, it's a resin cures build plate. in between. Like yeah. Right. Like it's not a solid build plate. Like for people listening to the audio, it's a gr- like a it's a oh, floor yes. grate. There are <laughs> holes in there because it actually need the resin needs to drip back underneath it into the pool as the whole thing gets submerged uh, inside. And so in those holes, you have cured bits of resin they have to pick out. And then so you the, end up with yeah, go for it. Does the resin then take up all the heat from the actual printing then? Is that a, a problem or is that fine in this method? Because it's one I thing when you're pulling it out of the resin and it's like all the heat is, you know, just being exposed to the air. Uh, I think it's I think it's OK. I, I the one issue I have right now is so I'm I do all of my printing in my basement, in my house, and I live in upstate New York and it is winter right now and probably, <laughs> I don't know, 30 degrees outside and my basement is 65, it says. So I need to continuously run like a little space heater in here when I'm deciding I want to print something for the night. I'll turn it on and sit in here and work on stuff and then turn it off before I uh, finish up just to have it the room temperature above 68 or 70 because some of the resins just if it's too cold, it's not going to print properly. And with that hitchery machine, you've got a huge bucket of resin. And when you run into a print failure on that machine, as it stands right now, it is not fun (laughs) trying to siphon all of the cured bits of resin out of that massive bucket. And the video I showed how they gave me a they sent me a big, huge syringe so I could try and suck some of the resin out and pour it back into a bottle to make it easier for me to pour (laughs) the resin back in and it was just all right let me pour a little bit into this bottle and then a little bit into this bottle and then a little bit into this bottle and it's not a quick literally thing. a it's, comical it's a... giant like medical syringe like you use yeah yeah it's it's definitely comical um oh my god <laughs> not saying that i have it sure. on the desk here but i have it on the desk here filled with uh this ninja turtle ooze <laughs> oh like like you asked about the heat, you know, and I've got to find resin, another bottle of resin. Well, that's why that's sitting there. <laughs> it, it's an exothermic process. So like, you know, heat is good for the heat. Help, you know, you, that's why like the form has a built in blower. You want the resin at a certain temperature. And that's why even going back mm-hmm. to the beginning, when we say these uh, manufacturers release profiles, they're very conservative in their settings because the one thing they can't control is yes. the user environment and and the wide ranging temperatures that people operate in temperature being like one of the most important factors um, in how well it cures. And so heating up the resin actually is a good thing. Like I, I, sometimes I'll put um, my resin, shake it up, of yeah. course, but I'll s- submerge it in some warm water before starting it. Cause once it starts the heat in, in the process and in enclosed, it actually is, is pretty good. Um, it doesn't cure the resin, the heat itself. You know, it's still UV dependent at that four or five nanometers. Uh, but yeah, yeah. it's I, yeah, yeah. I like the, the reason f- I ask is the it's creating like a temperature gradient in the pool of resin has been like I know that is a problem. I had my first like I print in my garage with my mm-hmm. Mars Two Pro, and uh, I had my first like uh, it was just one of those like cold cold in quotes san francisco nights so it was like you know like 50 in my garage yeah and so like i told that'll do it uh, yeah i totally (laughs) effed some stuff but it was it like the temperature sensitivity of the process i think is uh one of those things that i wonder when you have a big bat vat of resin and because that is hundreds of dollars um in that vat um (laughs) how much you attention you have to pay to to details like that and that's why i like the innovation when you're talking about the bill plate i think those innovation those small innovations that affect workflow are going to be the ones that like rule the day coming up yeah yeah oh yeah without a doubt yeah it, it's yeah. It, you whatever it is to simplify the process and for resin printing for me it's typically whatever simplifies the cleanup process is you know, going to help exponentially, you know, make me want to continue to use those machines like the, the wham band, those, those flex plates. The reason why I have on so many of my printers is I don't want to spend a minute trying to scrape (laughs) prints off a bill plate. I just want to pop them off and be done with it and slap it back on there. And even funnier is 
Uh, on on Twitter, there's a, a young lady, Willow Willow Creative, yep. who has a Piopoli Phenom and has this flex plate on there. And she posted she posts all sorts of crazy videos of her making cosplay stuff. But she posted one where it showed her just. I always for like the past year, I took the entire build plate off, and then would you know take the take the flex plate off and it just she just went up there and pulled the flex plate off and then flex her prints and then put the flex plate back on i was going wait wait what i've been overdoing this by one step i could have saved a whole step here in this process it's only seconds but that kind of adds up when you're doing a million one thing other things yeah and it makes things like you know for for willow creative what she does is you know, designing like chain mail to be printed on resin printing so and it's super impressive. fast, right? In like so half an hour, you can get a yeah. sheet of chain mail on, you know, as big as your build plate will allow. And that flex plate allows you to pop all that off uh, super easily. Yeah. It's so impressive. Uh, so, go, so impressive. Go, going back to the Hitchery printer, uh, the one thing mm-hmm. we got to make clear is like, uh, unlike using a LCD as a masking layer for the UV light, they're projecting the UV, um, Yes. From the top to the bottom. So something you mentioned in your yeah. video is you know you you're you're constantly looking at that lens because their calibration on that lens and that space between the UV projector and the flat you know surface of where the resin plate or the pool is on top of that plate has to be perfectly calibrated for for the layers yes. to look right. Um, and, and I guess they they've done it successfully because you have good looking prints. But that's where like. That's why previously it was more in the professional realm. Yeah, and I'm I'm still wondering. Uh, funny enough, I go b- circling back to TikTok. I saw another uh, another creator on there that I just recently realized was on there. The Digital Armory has one of those like a hundred thousand dollar resin three printer. I'm, I'm assuming it's it's for some sort of business related thing that he must be working with or for. Um, but was mentioning in his video. Uh, because he was commenting on this one and why there's such a big difference in price. And he was saying there is so many sensors in his machine compared to this. It's sensing, you know, his machine is, is the resin at the exact right level? Is it at the temperature that it needs to be at? If it's not, it adjusts things to be at the right temperature. Is it when it lowers and lifts the build plate, it's sensing where the resin's at to make sure it's exactly where it needs to be to get the perfect uh, curing for the, the however it's projecting down onto the resin. It's, uh, but it's still at, at this level it's still impressive to me to see this tech here and that it actually is working. Yes, it's dare difficult, but it, to me, it's sort of like this is the first iteration of what we're seeing. It's like three or four years ago when I used my first resin three printer, it almost put me completely off on using the whole process <laughs> because it just didn't work that well. And now it's gotten so much better with how these machines work. It'd be exciting to see how these things evolve, I think. Oh my gosh. And and the community along with it, right? Like people are becoming experts every day <laughs> because of videos like yours and because of you know places like the the, the resin printing subreddits um and all the different manufacturers and all their, their subreddits. Um but I want to talk about some of the, the models that you've been printing and, and let you shout out some of your favorite creators oh my goodness. that you love printing, right? Like I know you know for oh us, my like goodness. Photos, but like tell tell us about some oh, of the people man. you love following. Yeah. So I uh I mean, there there's some core ones that I, I I typically go with. You know, Photos Mint is just continually pumping out amazing things every month. Lots of typically uh, mo- busts and models and, and characters. Uh, Wexter is another one who just makes he, he he's sort of known for making these little mini dudes, and he made an actual book of Boba Fett. He made a little miniature Boba Fett mini, and then a book that you can 3d print that he'll go in, which I thought was really cool. But he also makes, uh, he started making masks. Actually, I think the, uh, the Punisher mask behind me here that I have hang up was his mask. I think that was him. I can't remember if it was him or photos Mint that helped design that for me. Um, and then, Oh, here we go. We've got one sitting here. This is, uh, I did a whole bunch of stuff here with the Loki crowns, uh, Nico industries. I print a ton of stuff, primarily a lot of his stuff, FDM, all cosplay related, and just has a team that he works with that just designs and pumps out amazing cosplay stuff for 3D printing. And there's what's so cool is the 
it's an ever growing community of makers. And for me, I'm always looking for, oh my gosh, someone that's making something that's really, you know, amazing pop culture related usually, and that I can show off in a video. And at the same time, I can support those makers by either Patreon or buying their files and where they're selling their sites. And it's such a cool thing to be able to see and that can, you know, growing as you know, the, the community continues to grow. We're seeing more and more designers, or at least I feel like I'm seeing more and more designers pop up and show off amazing things uh, that are that are out there. And uh, give me two seconds. Norm, you're going to have to talk for two seconds because I need to <laughs> look up the name of someone because I have an... Uh, oh, here we go. I've got it right here. Uh, J.P. Smith Sculpts. So let me show this off real quick. Has a... Wow. This is a Gambit bust that I printed on the Jupiter that I'm going to be showing off in a video makes some of the most amazing statue files that are out there. And I believe has a handful over on uh, my mini factory that you can buy, uh, but is a, an actual sculptor for, what was it? Bowen? Bowen? Bowden? I'm trying to remember what the... Bowen I was going to say that yes. looks like a Bowen yeah. designs. Y yes. Lifestyle. Yeah. Yeah. Has, has actually made statues or sculpts for those uh, for those companies, for statues. And it's just incredible. And I've been so happy that he's uh, shared some of his, some of his files with me. And again, he's got some that are available online that you can, that you can actually buy and print yourself, but it's so cool as someone being a big fan and collector of toys. I have like hot toys behind me and action figures that I bought and I used to buy. I worked at KB toy store way back in the day, just so I could get a discount on buying action figures <laughs> when I was in high school. <laughs> um, but being able to make my own statues of X-Men and Batman and other superheroes that are out there is just the coolest thing to me. And it never stops amazing me when it comes to printing these things. <laughs> and I, I, I should actually finish some of them. Norm, do you actually finish any of the, the, um, the like the paint, any of the stuff that you, that you print? <laughs> just, you know, I, I started doing this past week uh, is uh, putting some uh, swashes on them just to show off some of the okay. sculptural details, you know, it's just, but, but like color paint, it's, it's like, oh, I'm so terrible at it. I'm so terrible at it. Um, well, you're yeah, the you're the LED guy. The you're yeah, the, yeah, the lighting. You're the light. I, li I like I, I like lighting lighting stuff up. Light yeah. light and smoke. That's normal. Yeah, there we go. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> like like carbon three D Kishore, right? Yeah, light and oxygen yeah. in in some form. Um, uh, speaking of so the pop culture stuff and some of the toys, I noticed. Uh, I don't know. You did a video as well, but you're one of the few people I know who has the Hasbro the HasLab Sentinel, the big, the big Sentinel. Oh, hold, hold on. So, I mean, I, I, any, any excuse for me to drag this over and play with it, I will gladly, this is my, this is my oh baby. Oh my this gosh. Is my <laughs> three month old baby. <laughs> it is so, it, it was worth every penny in my, in my, wow. <laughs> as somebody that's eagerly massive. awaiting the, the Galactus. Uh, this this brings me joy to see see you have uh, this scale because, like, when I saw the Unicron, I was like, uh, "That's like yeah. too much, too like too much in many different dimensions, like too much money, too much size and stuff." And when I saw the Sentinel, I'm like, "Oh, this is a positive direction." <laughs> <laughs> and the and the Galactus is even taller than the Sentinel. Yeah. And for I guess for anybody that can't see what I'm holding up, I have a I don't know. It's got to be two feet two and a half feet tall sentinel from the x-men comics or cartoon and it's one of the it, it is the biggest action figure that i own and stunning detail great paint job on it it's still one of these things that i keep saying i'm going to go through and weather it to make it look a little bit more battle damaged and scarred up i just give me give me another six months before i uh, you know ruin it with my own paint job here <laughs> And this is one of those things that's sold out because they ran it as you know their crowdfunded HasLab campaigns, um, both this, the Galactus, and some of the Star Wars stuff they've done. They knew like Ghostbusters uh, proton pack as well. Yeah. Um, so like it's it's one of those like you 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 put that money in, you know, a couple hundred dollars, and you have to wait a year till you get it. Oh and, my god! Oh. It was the longest wait 
the longest wait for that thing. I was, I kept right. checking. I was going, is it, is it shipping anytime? It's over a year now. And at this point, I was the like, when is this thing coming? The best approach is just to completely forget about it and then be surprised when you get like tracking information gets, yeah. <laughs> and you're like, what is this? And you're like, a no, kid the worst, Christmas. no, the worst was, um, I knew that they were getting out because I saw people posting on Reddit in the action mm-hmm. figures, subreddit, <laughs> such nerdy things but uh, that's right you can find me on the action figure subreddit um but uh my wife loves all this by the way and <laughs> being very sarcastic and uh seeing other people with it and i was going where's mine i want mine <laughs> they've had theirs for weeks now when am i gonna get mine <laughs> yeah yeah but the uh, galactus one what 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 are the what are the figures that are coming with the galactus do you know oh sure uh, there's a nova and a silver surfer i believe and then oh, they yeah. have a face that's like a doom face that goes on the oh, oh nice and the that's sentinel exciting. came with the master mold right like the, they they reach all their yes. stretch goals so yeah different swappable heads um yep. yeah the, the stretch goals are awesome for that um i just got an email that the uh, the razor crest from the mandalorian seasons one and two most of two uh they're yeah. finally writing that for shipping soon so i can't wait to, to that get was that. the original one wasn't it was that the original uh, Haslab project well they, they, they did a couple i think omicron uh the uh well, oh, no. on, um the, oh uh, that's right yeah they, they did they did have a couple of failures like they had a cookie monster yeah that i guess before Haslab became was a you know a well-known thing and that one didn't make it and it was such a great deal for like a sesame street cookie monster puppet uh but now they've they've had a couple i, I think like you know, the proton pack did real well that succeeded the gi joe one uh the rancor i don't think succeeded from star wars but it's i think it's a great program for you to get yeah. these you know I, these these toys yeah i i think that they the the hasbro lab stuff if if it was it doesn't have to be as big and crazy as the sentinel or galactus in my opinion but if if they were able to do something at like the 200 dollar range i feel like they might get a lot more traction with it or maybe potentially less failures or not maybe back to back three hundred and fifty dollar <laughs> uh projects that they're kicking off it, it might help them out a little bit here and there i again i don't know what do i know if, if they're selling i, I just have a credit feel, card that i <laughs> it almost feels like their success isn't about number of sales but the buzz that's created from the from the figure it's and the true. campaign itself because we're not talking about like, you know, some small boutique, you know, statue company. This is Hasbro, right? right. So um, it, it but I'm just happy they're moving into these like higher quality um, elements, even if it is crowdfunded and it's not, you know, there's all sorts of downsides to to the crowdfunding, you know, besides the the sort of weighting that comes with it. Um, I'm just excited that that we're seeing some shifts there. Yeah. Did you, have you guys ever been to Toy Fair in New York when it was I'm still not. up and running before COVID? No. Yes. It's the one the, the one con that I've been wanting to go to. It's the toy, <laughs> toy con. That, you know, is very much like a CES. It's a more uh, a professional industry event. It's not kind of not not yes. not like a uh, Comic Con open to the public. It's more meetings no. behind doors, like close off booth spaces. When you're walking, it you're mostly seeing white walls because you have to like open another. It's like rooms they've built in Javits Center. Uh, but you know the the folks that get to go get to show off the latest and all the prototypes and that stuff. Gets, all the gets coolest stuff cool. to, that's yeah. coming. I was like, I need to know. Absolutely. I need to know. <laughs> yeah, it's the overseas ones. Like they have like in in Shanghai and Tokyo those big statue and and toy events like where yeah it really feels like a comic now we're talking but it's all statues like i want to go to one of those i i need to go to that big hot toys event that i've seen online that is posted where they have the figure and then they have the statue version of that figure right next to it's going oh can i go to this please <laughs> i need to see all of those in person yeah. um so Want to wrap up a little bit uh, soon. Uh, I want to get you also uh, speaking of the, the Mandalorian and um, and some of the pop culture stuff. Some of the shows you guys have been watching. Um, Kishore, oh, yeah. I know you've been on a recent sci-fi show binge. So uh, what, what's what do you recommend? It's almost like I can't handle reality and I needed an escape for some reason. <laughs> um, uh, so I have been uh, just going knee deep in a bunch of shows. So I finished Witcher season two. My short review, it's not as good as season one. It misses 
like uh, a, a bit of an element, but it's still highly enjoyable. Um, I, I finished the wheel of time. I read the series and I don't recommend doing that, by the way. It is like you'll go through so many emotions of just like, this is exciting. I have like I'm slogging through this. Like it's so much material. But I was I, I'm pretty thrilled with the uh, adaptation so far. I think it's one of the better unheralded. You know, it's hard to say that because The Wheel of Time has definitely gotten a lot of uh, press, but is super high fantasy. Um, uh, and now I'm digging into uh, the current season of The Expanse, which remains my favorite sci fi show uh, out there. Uh, and then I started uh, Station Eleven, a book I also read, uh, which is something uh, that you're watching as well. Or yeah, you finished, right? I, um, there's one more episode to go. It airs this evening, I think, is the final episode of the first season. It is. I, I had a friend that watched it. I was like, hey, I think you might like this. Don't watch anything about it online. Just just start watching it. I was like, OK, sure. And yeah, it is one of those shows that really hooked me as being something different, very story driven, very sci fi dystopian esque. <laughs> so uh, it, I, it's uh, raises your paranoia levels a little bit as well at the same time. <laughs> I will say the first episode hits very close to current news, but it does have like a story set in a in a different. I mean, it is post apocalyptic in a lot of ways, but it has like a really different character set for that post apocalyptic yeah. world, um, which is what makes it uh, uh, really fascinating. Uh, you might have noticed I didn't mention the book of Boba Fett, though. Um, oh. I have watched it. But like, I don't think it's in the same category of the shows that I just mentioned. Yeah, it's fine. It's fine. It's one of those. I, I think I, I've been trying to think about like what what is it about this show that isn't you know jiving with me? And it's it's like my expectations. Like I want maybe I want a Star Wars show that isn't you know uh, on Disney Plus. I want a Star Wars show on HBO. Mm-hmm. That's like like the you know when I when I hear the name of the book of Boba Fett and the the premise is, is he's gonna be uh you know the 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 new Daimo of Tatooine he's gonna take over Jabba's role in Tatooine and it's gonna be about the crime lords and the you know the the, the scum and villainy uh you know in my mind I'm like ooh is this like gonna be like Game of Thrones political intrigue like that's kind of what I want. And Ooh. what I'm what I'm getting is just a little bit too similar to the Mandalorian, um, which is fine. I love the Mandalorian, but this feels like retreading like that a little bit too much. Yeah, uh, I, I won't mention any spoilers, but can I get your opinion on parkour? Because. <laughs> 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 uh, it's not like why are why is movies and TV shows still doing parkour and things? It's like it doesn't look cool to me. At all. Like maybe, I don't know, 10, 15, 20 years ago it was cool. But now it's just kind of it's just goofy to me. It looks very silly seeing parkour chase scenes and people I, I, swinging from rafters and things. In, in my house when that happened um my wife yelled parkour like from the office yeah. and then i did from a somersault office. on the yeah. floor <laughs> <laughs> so uh yeah i i share your like it it just didn't ring authentic like we've also really never seen that in the yeah. star wars universe so it also just felt like weird I did. I'm okay very, with very like odd. I'm okay with th- showing them showing things that we've never seen in the Star Wars universe. I would be I actually would love for them to show us more stuff that we're not familiar with in Star Wars, but I think it's all about like how it's shot and how it's used. And that sequence just felt like okay, for this next, you know, minute and a half, we have a par- here's our parkour sequence. Here's that's our action <laughs> sequence. Yeah. Uh and 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 that took me out of it. Right. Uh, all right. I'm still excited well, for the show. Yeah. Yeah. yeah you know, I'm well, still watching it. Yeah. I just think the ceiling for the show isn't what we're seeing for some of these other sci fi and fantasy shows, which have really developed out premises. And I, I think my main complaint about the book of Boba Fett is that they haven't created compelling characters around Boba Fett yet. Um, that make it like none of the shows that we're talking about rely on a single character. They have multiple 
uh, kind of um, other pieces on the table that make it go. I think the Mandalorian was kind of unique in that way, in the sense that I guess we can say Grogu was compelling, even though it didn't say anything, but like re- largely it was driven just by a single character. Yeah. 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 And people are going to come back and watch every week, right? They can, I think they can afford to take risks story wise and not let each episode have to check a box here and there. Uh, because it's you know because it's Star Wars and it's it's like that double edged sword of they need to make it accessible but at the same time you know the, the people are going to come back and watch it and and expectations are high because it's Star Wars yeah so you know like I said we'll we'll continue watching um, but we'd love to know what people out there are, are watching and what they recommend um, on TV or on YouTube and hopefully on YouTube you're going to go over here and subscribe to Uncle Jesse's channel uh, and also on TikTok. If there's one thing we learned is that, you know, don't <laughs> don't forget about TikTok. Hey, don't sleep on TikTok. Don't sleep if on you're TikTok. Making stuff, That's right. Post it on TikTok. <laughs> um, Clayton, any other things you want to give a shout out to or recommendations or uh, things that we can look uh, forward to? No, no. Uh, if you have a resin 3D printer and you want to make time lapses, grab a resin lapse, resinlapse.com. <laughs> Shameless plug. <laughs> Uh, that, that's all I had. I, I, I just want to say it was so cool. Thank you guys for having me on this as well. Uh, being able just to hear the intro live while here, <laughs> like listen to the podcast so many times from my car when picking up my kids. <laughs> so hearing it, oh, hearing I, it in I'm person. I'm so sorry. Very cool. I'm so sorry your kids <laughs> had to go through that. <laughs> oh, no, 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 no. Not when they're in the car. I have to flip it over to, you know, Spider-Man theme songs and other fun stuff like that for them. <laughs> Oh. nothing but Encanto Thank over you. here nothing but nothing <laughs> that over in this house right now that's that's what we're watching non-stop it's great I love it that's good I love 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 we don't talk about Bruno over and over and over and oh. over again <laughs> oh we're gonna I would have an argument with you about that I I actually I'm not feeling the Encanto magic <gasps> as much as other people oh you don't have a three-year-old <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much, Clayton, again. We'll have all the relevant links no, of things you, you mentioned uh, and the creators you mentioned in the description below. Um, but until then, we will see you next time. Bye-bye. Hi there. I didn't see you. That's it. Alexa. Oh, I should have said that. What did you do? What did you do? I'm so sorry. I'm so. Cancel.